What do you all fear? Truly think about it for a moment. And I suspect that as commanders, as tacticians, our fears stem from the unknown, from uncertainty, not knowing if you'll make the right choice in that life-changing split-second decision in the heat of battle. When brothers and sisters in arms under your charge turn to you for guidance and for leadership. I do not say this to question your courage or your resolve or your confidence as commanders. I say this as a testament to the heavy way to command, to the sacred trust you are given by those you lead. But the hard and grim truth is that all of us have and will continue to make mistakes in command. None of us are perfect and missteps are expected. That is how we learn and grow. So what does this have to do with why you're all here today? And let me tell you, both as a war gamer and as a former Sergeant of Marines, you're here to make mistakes. You're here to learn, here to challenge one another because within the safe confines of a war game, you're given the opportunity to hone and master your first and foremost weapon, your mind. And like any other weapon or tool, mastery requires time, repetition, and failure. This is the essence of educational wargaming, to prepare the leaders of today with the experiences and critical thinking skills required to meet the unknown and uncertain challenges of tomorrow. Wargaming enables you to put theory into practice against a thinking and adaptive adversary. There is no better form of training than that. War games reveal the difference between simply remembering knowledge or recalling experience and being able to truly internalize knowledge and leverage your experiences for better decision making. Through iterative wargaming, you will begin, begin to recognize patterns not only within yourself, but within your adversary. This will allow you to correct false mental models, challenge assumptions, and fix bad habits. This in turn will enable you to think and act faster and each new game will present new opportunities, unique experiences, each with their own insights and lessons. In doing so, you will not only hone your mind, you will radically expand the reservoir of experiences you're capable of drawing upon. So as you continue to develop and grow the UK Fight Club, I encourage you to be bold, to be innovative, to think outside the box, because today is the day to make mistakes when the stakes are low. But most importantly, remember, you're both here as a student and instructor. You're here to share your collective knowledge with each other, to build a community of experiences, to push one another to be better. Find comfort that you're in good company, not only here in the United Kingdom and the British Army, but around the world. The UK Fight Club is part of an exciting and emerging new wave of educational wargaming. There are similar uh, Fight Club initiatives in the U United States and my beloved Marine Corps and the Australian Army that seek to cultivate the next generation of leaders and commanders just like you. At the same time, educational wargaming continues to grow in amazing and unexpected ways. In recent years, military education has increasingly embraced wargaming as a tool in the classroom for experiential learning. Furthermore, new educational wargames like DLTL Strike, the Marine Corps Assassin's Mace, and the RAND Corporation's hegemony open new and creative avenues for educational wargaming to advance both into the operating forces and the classrooms. But islands of excellence are not enough. Our efforts at educational wargaming cannot be siloed away in our own little corners. We must work to connect our individual efforts, including the UK Fight Club, into the wider wargaming community. I stress the word work here because that is exactly what is required. Time, effort, and energy from all of us to go beyond what is simply expected and execute what is needed, what is absolutely necessary. In, in, the, in the pursuit of this goal, earlier this year, I, along with several esteemed colleagues like Ed McGrady, Jim Lacey, and Nina Collars began a new organization and initiative called Educational Wargaming Cooperative, or EWC. Our mission is to advance educational wargaming through collaboration, by collecting and disseminating best practices, by sharing ideas and techniques, by partnering in new endeavors, and most of all, supporting one another globally. My hope is that we are able to forge a tighter and more collaborative community for wargaming. So one day, the educational wargames my Georgetown students create can be leveraged by you, all here at the UK Fight Club. 
And in turn, you can share your operational experiences with my students to create better informed educational wargaming. I am truly excited for the future you all represent, a future where British officers can test their wits against each other, but also against partners and allies in annual wargaming tournaments, a future where gaps between academia, the operating forces, and the policy world are bridged by robust and regular wargaming. The future is indeed truly incredibly bright. So let me be the first and have the distinct honor of saying this first. Welcome. Welcome to the Wargaming community. I look forward to your contributions, not only to the British Army, but to the global community of Wargamers. But let me leave you with one final piece of advice. Fear and uncertainty are not the enemy. They are merely the starting conditions. Ignorance and the failure to learn are the enemy. The only question is whether you all seize that opportunity to meet the challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. And if this was in a real life, you, we would all be applauding very, very loudly, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> so thank you. And I think you raised a very, very, uh, a few very, very important uh, points, especially on, on the community uh, and, and the learning and not to be afraid to, to make that, that, that failures and, and try again. So, so thank you very much for that. Um, I'll continue um, with, our, with our next speakers. So um, the next speakers are, are both analysts from the, analysts from the ESTL. Um, first, I would like to introduce Paul Strong. Uh, Paul is an historian and analysis from, uh, from the UK uh, Defence Science and, Techno and Technology Laboratory, uh, DSTL. He's a principal analyst uh, at the Ministry of Defence and is specialised in war game design, scenario development, um, war game adjudication, adjudication and red teaming. Um, you're the, he's the co-author of Artillery in the Great War and, you're, and he edited a volume on the changing role of women in the warfare in the 20th century. Um, recently he published a work um, on the role of the Royal Navy's Western approaches to tactical units during World War II and the future of, um, of, of the future role of artificial, artificial intelligence in the Royal Navy. Um, he will be uh, closely followed by Stevie Ho. Uh, Stevie Ho, he is a, a analyst within DSTL as well. He works at the Defence Wargaming Centre in, um, in Portsdown West, and he's specialised in war game design and historical analysis. He has been a war game uh, as a hobbyist for 20 years, years now, and he received a master's in, in history of warfare with, with a specific specification, specialization, sorry, in conflict uh, simulation from King's College. So uh, both are, are very well fit to talk about where does uh, war gaming come from? What's, what's the history of war gaming? Um, and where, where, how can we use war gaming in, in, in current times? So first of all, I, I think I'd like to give the floor to, to Paul, um, the virtual floor. So if you could take over, that would be great. Thank you. Right, there's a short technical moment here where I press share screen and hope for the best. Just give me a thumbs up if this has worked. Yes, it's there. Aha. Right, so I've got the, the honour of briefly introducing Wargaming. Most of you are familiar with much of this, but it's nice to underline all Sebastian's excellent points, uh, looking at why this developed, where it evolved from, and its importance. Uh, um, obviously, we've been Wargaming in a sort of play sense for centuries, and it's really the, the more recent development, the sort of 19th century onwards, which we should be concerned with. And it is interesting to note that while you know you those who don't war game lose most of the people who win do war game in some sense at least going through the challenges in their mind as sebastian described all of you know i suspect that all of this really began after the napoleonic wars when it became apparent that warfare had transformed and therefore the germans in particular paid some real attention to designing games that would enable their military to think about emerging challenges, to place themselves in a situation where decisions mattered, where not all knowledge was known and where actions had to be taken on the basis of a conceptual understanding of the battle space, as opposed to an assumption that you knew everything. The Wright's father and son partnership played an absolutely vital role in this, and Kriegspiel is 
basically the modern foundation of all modern gaming. The idea of two sides separated with a control area, with messages passing to the two teams, absolutely fundamental to the idea of hidden movement, of deception, <coughs> and the clarity of orders that they uh, folded into their game design. As a result, von Muffling, of course, the, 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 the liaison officer at the Battle of Waterloo, a guy who understood better than anybody, you know, the whole problem created by misunderstanding, by poor orders, by lack of coordination, had seen the realities of that on the battlefields of Lini and Waterloo, stated when he saw that, that this was more than just a game. It was schooling for war. It was a way in which you could truly understand how the battlefield might evolve. And as a result, the Germans used this for much of the 19th century to underline and design new concepts. Every time a new weapon system came in, they could test it against a potential adversary, they could think about how a maneuver would function, they could interface technology, and they could improve their plans. And for 50 plus years, this gave the Prussians a huge edge over the rest of the world. Of course, as soon as it became apparent what they were doing, gradually country after country started to copy this and get better and better at these ideas themselves ironically as the germans themselves declined and we don't have time to go into that but it's a it's an interesting area in itself the decline of war game is almost as important as its ascent the americans particularly embrace this particularly in the interwar period where the americans recognized as they were emerging as a global power they needed to understand their adversaries particularly the british and the japanese continuous wargaming was done against both those opponents and very famously nimitz came came with this quote and that is when they conducted actual operations these war games informed his decision making enabled him to understand how the strategic situation was evolving and enabled him to face those challenges with coherent planning ideas but also to transmit those through a community that also understood those same problems. The genius of the Naval War College is it shared those ideas and enabled people to understand what was going on as a group, as opposed to one inspired individual. But the Japanese, who also wargamed, managed to get it wrong. And another thing we need to understand is when war games do get it wrong, they get it wrong catastrophically. And the Midway War Game is a very good example of a war game that was designed to confirm a plan as opposed to explore it. And instead of being seen as a, a, a way of highlighting questions about how the plan would have worked, particularly the Aleutian Islands operation and the potential threat highlighted by the Red Team in that war game, of an American attack from on the flank of the Japanese operation, if they had the intelligence it was going to occur, those factors should have been played through into the final plan. Instead, it was seen as a, as a rehearsal rather than a test of the plan itself, and of course led to catastrophic defeat. But I think the example I'm going to use in the, the moment, the few moments I've got, which I think is the decisive one because it really underlines Sebastian's point, is the Western Approaches Tactical Unit. Basically, they were faced with a very important challenge, and that is what happens when the Germans have complete access to the Atlantic and are able to dominate what is known as the Mid-Atlantic Gap, the region where aircraft cannot drive the U-boats underwater, and therefore can then freely operate at night against convoys traversing the Atlantic. This went horribly, horribly wrong in 1942. The German pre-World War games had identified a huge opportunity, and as casualties began to mount, it became apparent that the British didn't fully understand how the U-boats were operated. So the solution was to come up with a wargaming process. So in February 1942, a group of Wrens, uh, led by a retired captain, uh, basically got together to wargame the problem. So they looked at the, 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 the intelligence reports, they analysed the way the campaigns had evolved, they realised what the German plan actually was, how the Germans were operating, and that is from within the convoys as opposed to outside. They wargamed that problem, recognised it fit the evidence they had, wargamed solutions, and then through extensive training courses were able to share those with the rest of the escort commanders operating in the Atlantic. And it is that combination of intelligence analysis followed up by coherent training and sharing that makes the Western Approaches Tactical Unit so successful. 5,000 officers went through the process and the escorts went from basically desperately fighting in the Atlantic to basically murdering U-boats, which is what they were doing by the latter part of the war. And there were, the ladies in question were very skilled experts in this field. This is an era when women were the majority of war gamers. 
Understanding the problem is the key to this. They had to have access to the intelligence for the whole of the war. And as new ideas, new experiences, new information flowed into the Western Approaches Tactical Unit, they were able to test these assumptions, design new approaches, design new tactics, and then further disseminate them through the same process. And not only did they do this, they also enabled this entire process to be picked up and transmitted elsewhere. There were Western Approaches Tactical Unit equivalents in Halifax and Canada, uh, there was one in Sierra Leone in Africa and there was one in India basically for the the, the, the Indian Navy also operate and was used post-war so this is a remarkable success story but what makes it <coughs> particularly interesting is their development of new tactics during the war they got to the point where they were able to predict how the Germans would react to a tactic and to develop tactics based upon when the Germans found a way to counter it. So we were always one step ahead to the point when, when the Germans introduced new technology, the acoustic torpedo, the T5, within 72 hours, they were able to identify the technology, understand how to mitigate it and develop a counter tactic while the battle still raged. So the latter phase of the battle, that tactic was able to be enacted and used. And this makes them, I think, probably the ultimate exemplar of, of wargaming at its very best in terms of understanding and disseminating. And it's worth remembering, the reason why they're able to do that is the students were the commanders of those escorts. So the intelligence they needed to, to nuance that war game to answer that question were already inherent in the process and they're able to thus feed the war games with the data they needed to then feed back the potential solutions leaving the commanders to do the minute by minute hour by hour our battle on the day and people like gene laidlaw the the analyst and, and, and janet o'kell here the red teamer were able to process this data and find solutions as a result at the end of the war when Captain Roberts, who headed the unit, visited U-boat headquarters, to his surprise, he was recognized immediately by the hundreds of U-boat personnel, and a few survivors of the force that were present. And when he asked why they appeared to fear him, he was taken through to the office and shown this picture cut out of an article from Time magazine in 1944, which the Germans had pinned up with this note, this is your enemy. Captain Roberts, director of anti-U-boat tactics. The Germans knew who had beat them, they knew they'd been beaten by war games. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> I wish I had uh, historians speaking to me like this when I was young. Very well. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting as well. So, How do I uh, unshare? Just a quick question. Uh, do I, can I, I, I can give you, the, give you the, uh, the time to unshare. Yeah, there we are. So our next um, analyst, I would like to give the floor to um, Stevie Ho, and I will share uh, my screen for your uh, slide. Hello, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, I'm Stevie Ho. I work with Paul at the Defence Wargaming Centre at DSTL, uh, and I'm doing a more recent uh, history. Uh, what has wargaming done for you recently? Sort of history. So, uh, I think the main thing uh, here is that um, over the last five years, um, DSTL and the UK government have really looked at developing wargaming, not just internally, but as part of a UK process. Um, a part of a UK process that doesn't see DSDL delivering all of its war games to, D to the DWC. That's not the point. It's to try and look at, yes, delivering war games in defence where they're needed, but also developing, improving the war game process and to try and bring more people into the fold uh, to, to gain a more holistic approach towards war gaming. But a cornerstone of that is uh, divisional level wargaming that we have been doing with the army uh, from 2015 to present. And really, uh, me personally, I've been working with strategic force development, looking at future army capability changes at the divisional level. Um, really, these are analytical wargames. They're not educational wargames, not meant for training. They're meant to try and find uh, not only what would be good for the UK to invest in, but what are our enemies investing in and how do we counter those uh, 
uh, those weapons now. The great thing about this is that really we've, what we've been allowed to do is competitive wargaming. We've been allowed to put a competitive red threat to do what they think is best, um, but also to do what, what is realistic, what is what are our adversaries doing against us to counter what we've got, and what can they do to us which we haven't thought of. However, when I talk about competitive wargaming, this isn't talking about playing to win at all costs. Competitive wargaming is about challenging each other to do better and to develop your skills in terms of wargaming, but also in terms of just the thought process of war. And quite often I find with a lot of participants is that the, when they come to wargaming, it's the first time that they've been able to actually sit and think about the process of war other than what is the mechani their mechanical job within the system of an army. And this is uh, something that uh, officers um, of Colonel and Below sometimes don't always get the chance to do. And that is mostly the players that we get. Most of our players from Army are at the Colonel level and below. This offers some strange insights into um, our wargaming as a whole, in that in the last five years, uh, Colonels and Majors have executed divisional level, i.e. two-star plans, more times than two stars have in the UK Army but they are the two stars of the future and they get to see these processes and see these plans come through. Now, although these war games are for analysis and for purposes of not developing personnel, the learning opportunities of these war games uh, go far beyond the purposes of them. Some of the things that I have noticed over the last five years is that for a start, these people are able to see red capabilities and tactics and, and action against them. Now, they will have seen reports, they will have had defence intelligence uh, briefs toward, to them. Uh, at DSDL, we also brief um, kind of what the red threats are. But briefs and reports are not as effective at conveying how all the working parts of the enemy system come together against you. You might know how deadly certain aspects of weaponry, such as sensor fused munitions, cluster munitions, etc., are from an academic level, but it isn't until you see an entire brigade being taken down in two hours with these weapons that you really get to experience the panic that you might feel when they start to come in and all of the other kind of emotional responses which people don't think they're going to get when they see a war game which is just a bunch of counters or a bunch of representations on a computer screen in front of them and i have seen real panic i have seen i've seen colonels who have served in afghanistan and northern ireland um, have to stop a war game and really rethink their plan through and this is because it's very rare that they're able to execute these plans. We have a lot of planning cycles, and, but we often get told this is the first, first time that they are able to execute what they've actually come up with. And often the original plans that our military players come up with significantly change once they've executed the plan. And we see that if we get the same players coming back, their future plans change because they realize actually we can't do this against this kind of enemy this won't work so they start to plan differently because they've had the experience of fighting this enemy and this is all within a five-year cycle and sometimes uh, we can't always get the same players in but even having one or two players who are at a previous war game who are part of the planning cycle and go sorry sir but that won't work because this this and this and often it's things that they have thought of but because they haven't had the experience of having to fight against an enemy they haven't realized the ramifications of what they're doing and what the enemy can do against them and this is part of fighting the unfamiliar it's not just about unfamiliar terrain which in most of the times we are talking about fighting an unfamiliar terrain in our war games uh, it's not just about unfamiliar situations uh, no one has fought in a peer-on-peer combat currently serving in in the uh in the uk armed forces but it's also about unfamiliar synergies it's unfamiliar synergies between uh different parts of the armed forces because um you all wear different cap badges you all have different specializations but it's also unfamiliar synergies between allies unfamiliar synergies between what your capabilities do against the enemy capabilities and vice versa and this all starts to come together about when 
you play these war games and if we are lucky enough to have war games from different uh war gamers from different armed services it's about how to fight together often we find in the planning cycles that the the priority priorities between the RAF the army and the navy are quite different uh, the RAF hardly ever consider the needs of what the frontline army require when they're making their best effort and the army assume that the RAF are going to back them up for example these assumptions are uh, not necessarily unfair in both times when you look when you talk to people separately you can see where they're coming from but without learning to fight together and without actually bringing these people together and giving them a situation that they have to learn from and they have to try and defeat those points will never have come out they also highlight frictions within the army system themselves often when we do a plan you have like a separate logs plan a separate artillery scheme uh, and they all work towards a sync matrix but sometimes the language they use is similar enough that they all think they're talking from the same hint sheet and it isn't until they have to execute inside the war game that they realize that no those frictions are not going to be uh, are not going to be achievable as in they're not going to, you're not going to be able to overcome those frictions to get where you need to come from and it, if it wasn't for trying to bring these people together and learning how to fight together then that would be quite difficult large-scale exercises are very expensive and very difficult to pull out war games i'm not saying war games are particularly cheap some of them are, are quite expensive but they are less expensive and more achievable and more repeatable than large-scale exercises to try and get all of these bits of the, of the armed forces together building on all of those things uh, one of the key things here is that war games allow people to to practice against peer adversaries um peer warfare is something the uk has not had to do for arguably 75 years or 40 years depending on how you view the falklands and wargaming is one of the few ways to really practice high intensity warfare and this is something that a lot of the players that we've had over the last five years have really appreciated again because of everything that i said before they've not appreciated the red capabilities what they can do against against them and it allows them to within a safe space see what the dangers are and try and think of ways of overcoming them and this is important this is the reason why the last point is not thinking through the problems it's actually thinking the problems because often we don't even realize there is a problem to think about until we play these war games until they realize oh this is something that we have to try and overcome certain problems um certain problems like such as the weight of uh the weight of military equipment today especially in the west uh makes a lot of the terrain impassable terrain that in world war ii was passable by uh, main battle tanks is terrain that we can no longer fight over uh that alone is one of the key problems that we've discovered through this and players try and come up with solutions to these using modern technology but also just tactics and their own acumen but another abil ability for it is from the flip side it's not just about the army learning it's about uh it's about the uk government's allies learning about how this all works together there's quite a few times that we've looked at red capabilities and wondered exactly what is this for we know what their stated uh, aim is for this capability and only through wargaming have we been able to say actually this only makes sense if you use it in conjunction with these things and now their investment in these areas makes sense and you can see it so it's not just about understanding how the army defeats our enemy it's about understanding how our enemies try to work to defeat us and that's the recent history of wargaming at DSTL. And thank you, Stevie. Very, very informative piece, and especially the last thing about thinking problems. I think we will come back to that later. Okay. So thanks again. Um, so I would like to introduce our our new speaker. Uh, the, the next speaker it's uh, Nav McMillan. Uh, Nav has worked in the tactical and command and staff training by using virtual simulation, constructive and wargaming since 2009. Um, he has had a uh, quite a unconventional military uh, career, both as a reservist and in the regular army. He initially worked for five years on, on <coughs> unit-based uh, virtual training 
um, both uh, delivering for Opheric and Optelic. Um, he is been involved heavily recently in experimentation uh, using uh, unit-based virtual training in the Army Battle Lab um, for the Army <coughs> Armed Infantry Battle Group experiments, the experiments around uh, urban strike and uh, the close combat exper experiment experiments. So, um, Nev, I would like to, to give the floor to you, if that's okay. Great, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so building on the previous speaker, I'm going to talk about UBBT and some of the issues and lessons learned from that. Um, so let's just uh, move on. So I'll quickly cover UBBT, uh, unit-based virtual training. It's in service with the British Army and it's used extensively. I mean, whilst it's in service to deliver training, it is used extensively to deliver an off-the-shelf simulated environment for force development experimentation. Um, which is where I'm going to pick out some of the lessons today. Um, so that's obviously to get new capabilities into the hands of soldiers to explore some of the tactical human factors issues that otherwise would be difficult to expose prior to the capabilities entering service. But just to baseline your understanding, UBVT is a five-year contract. It's in service now to deliver in-unit collective training predominantly focused on tactics, techniques and procedures and command and control. It's a mobile capability uh, able to be used by the whole of the field army to support their training progression from a crew level all the way up to combined arms subunit. And it's delivered at the point of need, which sort of is captured by the photograph on the bottom right there. Uh, UBVT uses in-unit infrastructure like uh, buildings and um, hangars and that sort of thing. And it's essentially uh, technology supported by uh, custodians and people who run it, uh, who deliver, um, who are able to generate rich scenarios and realistic missions and assist the unit in delivering their training. I will give a health warning up front that uh, I'll uh, I seek to provide my industry level perspective on the use of UBVT in a virtual environment to support uh, force development. Um, I'll stay away from discussing any specific uh, topics of the experiments and I'll draw on my own observations of about nine years of being involved in this kind of training uh, and that uh, my views do not represent those of Kinetic, the MOD or any specific participants of the experiments themselves. So uh, experimentation using UBVT, what I find is um, so you might imagine that these experiments will uh, explore a wide range of questions. While some of these will be well understood from earlier conceptual studies, war games or modelling, most will have been tested by experts or analysts, uh, those inside the programme if you like, and uh, who perhaps could become blind to the error. The learning outcomes from these experiments are revealed in testing the theoretical concept of using new capabilities which are yet to enter production against a very real live human context of an audience of serving soldiers which you can see in front of you. A tiny fraction of the units, oh sorry, a tiny fraction of the sort of questions that are posed might be um, what are the TTPs in use now, are, are they able to be ev evolved or will they need to be wholesale changed in order to uh, to you know, use the, con the concept that we are experimenting on. Uh, does the army have the right kinds of squat in the numbers in the right post? Do the new capabilities require such skills to fight them that the current cohort of soldiers find themselves ill-equipped by virtue of their knowledge, skills and experience? Uh, are they able to be trained or will we need to look to recruit um, new, uh, a different kind of soldier in the future? Uh, what are the key features of the capability? Um, what do the soldiers think are the battle winning features of these new capabilities? It may not be what was expected and it, uh, and it might change over time as they become more familiar with the, uh, with the capability. And how are our tactical leaders going to command this capability? Do our command and control methods need to change to maximize the benefits? Uh, for example, are we to employ greater, if we are to employ a greater level of dispersion over the battle space, what does that mean to our concepts of leadership uh, and commander visibility to his soldiers and, and those sorts of things? 
So the lessons I'm drawing are uh, broadly into three categories, I would say. And, and the first one uh, is realism. You need to have sufficient realism to generate the friction to investigate these human interactions. Uh, and, fric and the friction comes about from, I believe, from fidelity. I, you've got to create the right, the new equipments and the procedures, plus a level of scale to generate the procedural and cognitive burdens on the decision maker. It stimulates situations uh, with all the clarity and confusion of reality and to the decision maker, it presents a similar cognitive picture to the live operation, but at a more realistic pace than say a manual war game might do or a constructive simulation might do. These factors contribute to what I term positive stress. Uh, it gives you a level of flow, if you like, for the audience, which in turn engenders a, a realistic response, an emotional response, uh, which the previous uh, um, speaker mentioned. However, um, unlike some simulated methods, uh, the results can be very hard to repeat with any statistical accuracy if you're using a virtual environment. It also works uh, at a genuinely useful combined arm scale, which otherwise would be impossible or unaffordable to do live, particularly when we're looking at platforms that are yet to enter service. The second theme I would call upon is knowledge. Uh, this lesson acknowledges the importance of the audience being fully trained before experimentation can even begin. Using new systems is already likely to be more cognitively demanding since they are unfamiliar to the audience. Add to that a demanding and uh, rightly ambiguous tactical situation. This equates to a high cognitive load for the audience. The best outcomes from training come from comparing new tasks to prior knowledge to build long-term memory. The best insights from experimentation into the performance of a new system, be it a vehicle or a new sensor or weapon or whatever, come from comparing the difference between experience in the, in the experiment from a recalled memory of how the existing real system works. That does not suggest, and I'm not suggesting that participants participants should behave in the same way as they do now, but is about recognizing what better looks like and being able to evidence better from the understanding of the wider context of their actions. However, um, getting the audience to this stage can burn a significant amount of experimentation time. And we, as a rule of thumb, spend probably around 30% of the available experimentation time conducting training. And this is clearly a significant build to the experiment. And thirdly, is the desire to perform. Uh, this is, relies on, a, on a, a, a sort of mix of different factors, but I think it's really important. And that, that involves the chain of command being fully involved, clear communications, uh, leading to a clear understanding by the participants as to what is, what is expected of them. Um, and also added to that, a healthy sense of competition, a decent red team, uh, a credible and with credible simulation interfaces, a, a decent scenario and getting the real life factors right, you know, the ventilation and the comfort levels of the audience you know, um, appropriate. When you get this right, the soldiers are surprised that maybe three or four hours have passed and are sad when the day, their day using UBBT is brought to a halt. When it goes wrong, clearly, as you can imagine, you get un disengagement, unrealistic behaviors, and poor experimentation outcomes. So to con conclude, experiments using, um, sorry, to conclude experiments using a virtual environment such as that delivered by UBBT are an excellent method to give new concepts exposure to a much larger army audience. Um, UBBT, when used for experimentation, uses these same often junior soldiers and leaders to project themselves into the future in a way that is not possible or practical in, in many instances. The experiments provide a mechanism for demonstrating often to senior, but mostly to junior off leaders, uh, which as I am sure, much like the Fight Club uh, does now, provides a forum for all ranks to get involved and make comment and contribute. 
And I need not mention how important it is in an era where people are the army and where it provides these same junior leaders the chance to shape their own future as the stakeholders in it. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Nev. That's that's a very interesting uh, look into into your work and how we train our soldiers and especially the officers and and, and NCOs. Um, conscious of time, I would like to push on, um, and uh, we have hereby finished sort of part one of this webinar, um, which is give you an overview of, of what war game got what war gaming is in general, and we will now focus more into what is Fight Club actually. What is it? What are the big ideas? Uh, what have we achieved till so far, and, and what do we want to achieve in the near future? And in order to do that, I would uh, really like to introduce Andrew Elliott. He is a senior analyst from the operational analysis and research branch at the HQ Allied Rapid Reaction Corps. Um, he's been seconded from the wargaming team at DSTL uh, to project manage the implementation of a new war game that aims that aims sorry. Uh, to enhance operation analysis. Um, I would like to give the floor to Andrew and after that we have a nice video. Um, Andrew, floor is yours. Thanks Alex and thank you to all the previous speakers. Uh, it was been some really interesting talks so far. So six months ago everything you're about to hear had not yet happened. The members of this panel had never met. The wargaming and simulations you will soon hear of had not been run. And the only fight club anyone was talking about was the iconic 90s film. In that short space of time and through the chaos of a crippling pandemic, UK Fight Club has been born, survived and thrived. It all started with an innocuous poster or flyer, as Arnel calls it, on the back of the men's lavatory in army headquarters. This call to arms for maverick thinkers and status quo challengers quickly took root amongst the fertile minds at Andover. Once we took to the airways via social media, we grew rapidly into a global community of like-minded professionals, geographically dislocated, but never disconnected from each other. Our membership was, and remains, a plateau of peers. We privileged talent rather than rank and value diverse thought over dogmatic wisdom. We are a community that works out of passion, not profile. Our fighters come from all walks of life, from reservist riflemen to ministers at Whitehall. And perhaps most telling of all, our achievements that follow were delivered at no or low cost to defence by volunteers operating in their spare time. And if that doesn't excite you, here is a glossy video. Alex, I'm not entirely sure if you're sharing sound because I can't hear it. in live training but resource constraints will always impose a limit on quantity and quality. Simulation offers the opportunity to realise the appetite for professional development present in our junior officers and soldiers. UK Fight Club turns the traditional top-down model of simulation training on its head, putting commercial software directly in the hands of soldiers, provides them a community of peers seeking to grow and learn. My name is Aaron Moore and I'm a co-founder of UK Fight Club. We're using realistic commercial games to train and fight, helping us to improve in our profession as soldiers and having fun while doing so. My name's Hugo and I'm a co-founder of UK Fight Club. We don't war game often enough. This is about sharpening the mind as well as the body. I'm Andrew Elliott and I'm one of the co-founders of UK Fight Club. When, if ever, in training have you failed? In Fight Club, you will fail, you will learn and you will improve. Fight Club is a learning organisation. 
Fight Club is not about jumping into a battle royale with your mates. It's an opportunity to showcase your tactical decision making against your peers. One of the powerful aspects of Fight Club is the ability to harness the potential of a wide and diverse human network. Hello, my name is Sarah Chapman and I'm a founder of UK Fight Club. My favourite thing about Fight Club is there is no rank or cap badge limitations. It doesn't matter what your trade is or what game experience you have, everyone is welcome. I came from playing Fortnite and Call of Duty with my son to now thinking strategically on the virtual battlefield. Fight Club's mantra is think, fight, learn, repeat. This isn't about playing the game, this is about changing the game. This is training for war. Our group's aim is strategic. We want to change organizational culture for the better and make gaming more commonplace across all levels of defense and government. This allows Fight Club to truly serve as a platform for collaboration. Currently, we have participants from across defense in other government departments, in partner countries, and in universities and business. Follow us on Twitter at UK. Fight Club 1. So, no matter how many times you practice this at home, it's always uh, a, a surprise if, it, if, if you actually do it right when the moment is there. So, apologize if you don't, didn't get anything and it didn't get everything of that video. Um, at the end of this webinar, we'll send you the, the slide deck anyway. There will be a link to the video to, to, to watch it back if you, if you like. So, um, moving forward, I would like to introduce uh, two, uh, I would say, young captains. Um, two captains that have really took the opportunity to take this uh, fight club to their units. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you uh, Captain Ollie, uh, Ollie Elliott. Um, he joined the Army in 2012. He has served in the Armored and Light, Light Royal Infantry Battalion and uh, worked at the training uh, center in Catrick to train um, infantry recruits in their first places. Um, the next speaker will be Captain Greg Deeming. He is in Army Reservists serving with the Scottish and North Irish Yeomanry, and he's in the lead for their work with PBS, and he organized uh, the fight clubs for, for the reserves, both in, uh, within the UK and internationally. Um, I I'm, I'm very glad to, to give the floor, first of all, to Oli, uh, so please go ahead. Brilliant. Thank you, Colonel. Good afternoon, everyone. My name's Oli Elliott. Um, during my presentation, I'll be talking about Combat Mission Shock Force 2, which is a commercial off-the-shelf uh, computer game. And I'll tell you how I've been using it for training and uh, continuous professional development in my unit, which was Two Mercy. So I do need to stress that Two Mercy are not the only units who are doing this sort of training. I know that there's a lot of other units out there doing very similar things. So I'll start with a brief overview of what Combat Mission Shock Force 2 is, but basically it's a commercial off the shelf computer game. And most of you will be familiar with that sort of game. Um, those of you currently fighting through the clubs, uh, Operation Rising Moon are already familiar with it. Um, so it uses a high level of realism, <laughs> as a result it's slightly less user friendly than mass marketed strategy games. Uh, one person commands the whole of their force and fights against uh, either one other person or the computer. The smallest unit in the game is a section and you're able to give them a very detailed array of orders. However, uh, due to only one person commanding the whole of the force and how detailed you need to be when giving orders, we have found that the largest size of force that you can use uh, on this game is a company or squadron because it gets a bit unwieldy after that. So now that you know what Combat Mission Shock Force 2 is, uh, what have we been using it for at 2 Mercy in to do training? So we originally recognized how useful uh, Combat Mission Shock Force 2 would be for continuous professional development for our young officers, but we quickly realized that the training potential for it extended a much further than that. So for the continuous professional development we did with the young officers, we set up fight nights so that one officer could pit his tactical abilities against another. We gave the junior officers, each acting as a company commander, a bit of uh, OSW. They conducted an estimate, they then back briefed their actual OC uh, on what their plan was going to be, and then they fought through uh, their mission against another young officer. 
By the way, if any of you are looking to conduct a fight night of your own, I would warn against using too much OSW, uh, although giving the commanders uh, the context, their orders and some maps, and the ORVAT was really useful. Uh, once the simulated bullets started flying, I'm not certain how useful the two-up commanders' intent, intent really was when they were fighting the battle. Uh, but anyhow, back, uh, on each of the fight nights uh, we hosted, the young officers fought their battle, they conducted an after action review, dis uh, discussed how it went, and then refought the battle in order to try and improve on how they performed. What we learned from our fight nights is that simulated force on force battles are brilliant training and we ought to be doing more of them. Uh, too much of our training in the army is based on blank fire training, where at the end you'll get your debrief based on whether your TTPs uh, that you used were as they had been taught and rarely you'll get comments on whether your plan would actually have exceeded and it's also uh, rare that you get to pit your wits against a thinking opponent who's trying to outwit you. So we found that simulated training allows you to overcome these problems and it's also easy to organize. It can be conducted at short notice and quite importantly at the moment it is not very expensive. So our young officers were tested in ways that other types of training doesn't expose uh, their company commanders to some of the topics that the junior officers had little knowledge of and the company commanders were then able to focus the future training on in those areas it also allowed them to exercise alongside assets that we rarely use so the junior officers were being supported in the game by assets from fire support company they had access to vehicles and they were calling in artillery fire normally a junior officer wouldn't be able to get that sort of experience if he was on an overseas exercise in canada or kenya However, other than the uh, continuous professional development we were doing for our young officers, we realized that these commercial off-the-shelf games can be used to conduct other types of training as well. So it can be used to conduct a shoots. You can build maps in the game, give out the maps uh, of the train to a room full of soldiers who can see the game on a projector screen and then conduct a shoot. Uh, the big advantage of this over a normal shoot is that it can have an execute phase. So during a normal shoot, people natter away about where should fire support go, where should the FUP be, how will the attack go. The advantage of doing it on a computer game is then at the end, you get an operator to jump on the game and actually play through the mission. And you can find out whether you chose a good plan or whether in fact your FUP was in full sight of the enemy and everyone got shot before H hour. We also think that commercial off the shelf games can be used for experimentation. Um, so if you've got a company that's looking to try out new Orbat or new tactics, they can do this on a computer game by doing many, many repetitions with slightly changed Orbats to see which is the most effective. Uh, at Two Mercy, we think that, computer, uh, that commercial off-the-shelf computer games offer great opportunities for training, and we aren't wedded to Combat Mission Shock Force 2, and would be happy to experiment with other games, especially if you were able to link a number of laptops together so that you can have more than one commander fighting on each side. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for your time. And over to Gregor. Thanks, Ollie. Um, I'm Captain Greg Damien from the Scottish uh, North Irish Yeoman and I'm just going to speak today about what we've been doing with our distributed training. Uh, just to let you know, the SNIY, we are a light cavalry uh, reserve regiment uh, and the distributed training that I'm going to talk about has come out uh, primarily because of uh, COVID and the lockdown, but we're now looking to, to bring it on for the future. So for us, we harnessed uh, Virtual Battle Space 3, which is something potentially quite a few of you might be aware of it. Uh, it's the system behind uh, defense virtual simulations and used by unit-based uh, virtual training. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's actually based on the commercial off-the-shelf uh, computer games uh, from the Armor and Operation Flashpoint series of games. Uh, an extremely versatile and useful uh, bit of software. So how our training sort of came about? Well, uh, during lockdown, we were obviously had to think differently about how we were going to train. Uh, one of the biggest things is we were moving into the virtual environment uh, and it was look, a lot of the training that we conduct uh, as a light cavalry regiment is very, very practical. So it was how we could replicate that practical training. Now, I've been joking with one of my troopers that being in lockdown and being stuck in the house meant I had more, more time to play Call of Duty, but that got me thinking about how we can use uh, games to actually replicate what we were doing. Um, after conducting uh, a few experiments, uh, we were lucky enough to be able to get access to uh, VBS3 uh, from Bohemia Interactive Simulations, who uh, have been really fantastic in supporting us. And that allowed us to run what was Exercise Virtual Wolf. 
Uh, and for this, uh, for us, this was our first distributed uh, training weekend using uh, VBS3. Um, we had between 40 and 50 people attending uh, at different stages of the weekend with about 18 people using VBS. So that allowed us to deploy a troop uh, onto the virtual uh, battlefield. Uh, for this, all the personnel joined the exercise remotely. Uh, VBS3 wasn't really designed to be played over the internet, but uh, using our gaming knowledge, we managed to find a solution uh, using the Hamachi VPN, uh, which worked out quite well. Uh, all of the user uh, user training was uh, all the training was conducted uh, using inbuilt training scenarios and scenarios that were created by our, our in-house simulation team, uh, and their gaming knowledge from that to actually uh, create those scenarios. Um, the theory and practical training was delivered using a mixture of uh, software, namely MS Teams for theory lessons, uh, DBS or uh, VBS3 for practical lessons, and for our communication system and live streaming, we used Discord uh, because obviously it was designed for gaming uh, and therefore it actually suited our needs uh, quite well. Uh, so during this first exercise, we were able to deliver uh, a number of lessons, uh, artillery target indication, uh, which we actually found using uh, uh, virtual simulation, we can actually deliver this lesson better because you can actually have soldiers uh, map read within VBS3, uh, provide coordinates and actually see how accurate they are. And actually, instead of sitting on the side of a hill and pretending uh, to pick out targets uh, in the far distance, you can actually see the effect uh, that a gun line would have on its targets. Uh, we then went on to conduct uh, mounted movement in the open terrain and mounted contact drills, some of our, our basic uh, like cavalry drills just to test out the system. Now, this collective training was conducted with soldiers based throughout the UK. Uh, we had people uh, tuning in from the Shetland Islands all over uh, Scotland, Northern Ireland uh, and England. And we even had some of our soldiers who were stuck in lockdown in Canada uh, joining us. So it was a, a very uh, much our first uh, venture into sort of distributed training. And potentially the first uh, venture uh, for a NATO army into this kind of distributed uh, training as well. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. Just a couple of pictures you'll see of the training that we've conducted. The, jack uh, the jackal there, there concealed in cover. Uh, the next one of the um, uh, effect of the actual artillery target indication. Uh, and the last one of uh, one of the, uh, the two jackals conducting a contact and this is all user user built content as well uh, and the next thing we've progressed on from the exercise virtual wolf series of uh, exercise and what happened last weekend was probably one of the most exciting things that we've done uh, in conjunction with the, the Royal Yeomanry uh, we conducted exercise virtual elephant um, this was the first distributed exercise, I understand, conducted by uh, unit based first virtual training. Um, the exercise was conducted across the four, uh, four locations for the Royal Yeomanry, with UBVT uh, conducting training at three of these locations. Now, uh, the exciting part was the fourth site, which acted um, independently and was supported by us um, using the distributed method that we would uh, develop for exercise virtual walk. Now, this this foresight consisted of an army reserve centre uh, and remote users connecting in from home. Uh, in what uh, I believe is a first for VBS3 outside of a trial environment, uh, the Royal Yeomanry and the SNIY were joined by soldiers from uh, a reserve like cavalry unit from the Australian Army, uh, the first 15th Royal New, uh, New South Wales Lancers. Uh, and this was a really interesting experience because we managed to get people in from uh, the other side of the world and actually conduct uh, an international exercise at troop level. Um, we conducted dismounted and mounted training up to troop level and, and with that we were able to conduct this training with a mix Australian and British, uh, uh, British troops which was an exciting prospect and a first for, for many and is obviously can potentially lead on to future exercises. Uh, an exciting prospect the fact that you can train with your allied nations without leaving uh, the country uh, without leaving the country and obviously the cost savings that that bring with it and the ability to conduct this uh, training on a much more regular basis uh, and I'll just uh, show you a couple of pictures from the actual exercise so this is the the Australians uh, in their Bushmaster vehicles again the advantage of VBS3 is because it has such a wide variety of vehicles um, they were actually able to crew the same vehicle that they were uh, they, they use 
uh, within their regiment as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, that's one of the Royal Yeomanry soldiers mount, uh, mounting the 50 cal on a jackal vehicle. Uh, and then finally, one of our Australian colleagues uh, manning a GPMG on one of the Bushmaster vehicles. Uh, and finally, the most important thing I think about uh, for virtual training is it's an ideal environment and it's an, an environment for which the soldier can it, it's it's safe for them to train it's safe for them to experiment uh, safe to uh, innovate and uh, what i think has become a bit of a theme of this web, uh, webinar uh, safe to fail uh, and if you've got any questions later on about um, how we conducted this exercise feel free to ask and we'll answer them towards the end thank you Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Oli and Greg. Really, really well done. I think that's both uh, are perfect examples on, on how we, we can use uh, um, virtual means nowadays to, to keep up to speed with your training and even extend that to uh, into the international environment. So thanks again. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Allen. Uh, he has the focus on uh, irregular warfare and sub-threshold competition in the warfare branch of the Land Warfare Center. He has a wide experience in the capacity building and overseas operations uh, in which he served on multiple tours in both the joint conventional and specialized forces. He deployed on operations in Northern Ireland, the Balkan, uh, Yugosla into the Yugoslavian Civil War, into the Middle East, into South Africa, uh, sorry, South America and Africa and into Central Asia. He is an international relations graduate of Keele University and he has a master's degree uh, from King's College in London and Cranfield University. Um, I would like to give the floor to you, Dave, if you're ready. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Is All I'm gonna do is, I'm not gonna take up too much time, but I just wanna uh, highlight some of the value that I think Fight Club members can actually add. Is you've heard a bit already on the value of Red Team, Red Force. Uh, red team, obviously the internal challenge of the plan, the testing of the plan, whereas red force is actually the adversarial competitive side uh, acting as an adversary could be. And there's actually, there's a lot of, there's a lot of really uh, high level experts, expertise and experience involved in that. But actually there's a whole area of, I would say almost the gray area around the edges where I think Fight Club can actually add some real value. Is an old saying that to actually understand somebody, you have to walk a mile in their shoes. And if after that you don't understand them, it doesn't really matter because you've got a mile start on somebody who's got no shoes. It's about looking at problems in a diverse way. And Fight Club can actually bring that sort of cognitive diversity to looking at problems because as I think was mentioned earlier on, is if you're inside the environment all the time, is you could become slightly blind to the nature of the problem. And certainly one of the things within defense that was highlighted from the Chilcot report was groupthink that went all the way up to the strategic level of decision-making. And most of us who work in the MOD are familiar with the concept of reasonable challenge where actually if you see something wrong, you feel as though you can challenge upwards, is that can be quite difficult, not necessarily for the people making the challenge, but definitely for the people receiving a challenge. And cognitive diversity from a wide ranging group who can look at problems in different ways uh, is actually incredibly valuable. And as Donald Rumsfeld very famously said, there are knowns, there are known unknowns, but actually what Fight Club can do is actually look at the unknown unknowns. And a good, a very good example of that is when uh, Fight Club, provi uh, uh, a number of people across Fight Club uh, provided the Red Force in uh, a Matrix War game for Special Operations Command Europe, who were using it to test uh, their strategic concept. And I headed up um, the Red Force. There was also a Purple Force, uh, representing another Far Eastern country, uh, which, which obviously rather than red is purple, uh, but it gave an adversarial approach uh, to Special Operations Command Europe. But because of the diversity of the team, we found there were actually 
we were coming up with ideas, particularly sub thresholds that they had not actually considered because people weren't constrained in their thinking in the sense of we weren't doing exactly what an adversary might do, but we were doing what they, was plausible they could do and people were encouraged to use their imagination. So things were being weaponized, which the blue forces didn't even consider being weaponized. So actually that was a real great strength I think Fight Club can bring. And actually the more people who can look at problems differently is the better it is. And actually this isn't in competition with formal red teaming or formal red force, people who are experts in how the red force fights, but this is just providing those unknown unknowns because actually even blue forces don't follow their own doctrine. So certainly red forces don't either. So you can add that by using your imagination in a safe to fail environment. And that's all I've got to say about red teaming and red force. So Dave, thank you very much. Um, having a, a, a look at my watch, I think I'll have to, uh, to push on. Um, I, I would like to, um, to end with a slide from Fight Club uh, because if you, as you just have heard from Dave, that Fight Club is not only about high tactical, high kinetic uh, wargaming. Uh, our ambition is, is broader, much, much broader and, and therefore I think it's, it's important also to explain the title of this uh, webinar with, which is Choose Your Battle. Um, so I'm going to explain to you the ambition of Fight Club uh, by going through some, some future events we, have, we are thinking about. So first of all, we will continue with, a, with our inductions of Fight Club. So in the next uh, two weeks and in October and again in December, we will um, reach out to you and, and, and ask you to, to join us online to, to get into Fight Club more in detail. Uh, we will explain to you a bit more on what, what it is and what, what we're providing and what we need, basically also what you can take out of this. Um, the other thing we will continue is our own uh, design campaign on Combat Mission Shock Force 2, which is uh, called Operation Rising Moon. And people that have been on Slack for a while now have seen uh, that we have created a, a very interesting sort of campaign of, of, of small steps on the, on the tactical um, level to, to really sharpen your mind and to think again about how, how do I do stuff as a military commander. So we will continue that and you will be able to do that at home, provide feedback via our, our um, Slack community um, way, way of communication, so to say. But eventually what, what happened is from a fight club got the attention on the army headquarters. So head of FD um, was interested in this and he has um, set some money aside to really uh, to build an experiment, sorry, uh, to, led by DSDL to actually assess uh, what fight club can, can actually contribute to possibly to future post development. So we as Fight Club in uh, close coordination with DSTL and uh, the Army HQ head of FD are thinking about a series of events that we have called fight sessions. And now it's now it's become, now we'll, it will become interesting for you as well um, to getting to get really engaged in Fight Club. So what is it that we are thinking about? So the first one is fight. We call it fight session one. It is a tactical scenario or a series of scenarios which we'll which we will design together with DSTL which will uh, address future challenges and for which we will need you as fighters or um, participants to actually engage. For the army that means uh, we, we, the army can bring together some brain power and, and, and adaptive thinking to think about the challenges that are proposed. For example, to take to take one um, from the news, 
what do we do without tanks, for example? And if we are able to bring together uh, people that are already trained on, on combat mission and bring them together in, for example, Port Down West or just online, and we can start to actually test some new ideas uh, that will really ben that has the potential at least to really benefit the army. But for you as a player, it will give you the opportunity to train your adaptive thinking, to sharpen your, your planning um, capabilities and to think often and again and again about how you would uh, uh, cope with the challenges you've been offered. So that's, that's on the technical bit. But the next thing is actually the big idea behind Fight Club. And we call that now, and for now it's called Session 2. But it's basically a campaign and it's a campaign that will take uh, longer than just a, a week or a few days. The idea behind this campaign is that we integrate games on a different level, uh, so the tactical, the operational and the strategic level. We integrate different types of, of games, so not only combat mission and other um, computerized computer, computer games, but also the manual games. And what we really like to do is um, invite people to join uh, this campaign or this session at the level and in the area if, uh, on which, in which they are professional or in which they want to challenge um, their own thinking and challenge uh, the opportunities we, or, and the capabilities we have. So this means that we will, um, that you will get the chance to play it at the level where you best. So, um, that's something that is currently in, in um, sort of in, under construction. We're, we're discussing this with uh, DSTL, uh, but this is basically the the advantage that we're bringing as Fight Club that hasn't been uh, uh, within the MOD yet, and that's the integration of different games on the different levels, uh, and that's the benefit for the army and the armed forces. The benefit for you as a player will be to sharpen your your adaptive thinking. Uh, get better in in, uh, in your um, operational planning, your technical planning, and maybe even on the, in your strategic thinking. And thereby, we shape you can shape your professional mind and adapt your thinking further. And that basically uh, concludes uh, this webinar from our side of, of of the screen, so to say. And I would really like to uh, hand over the floor to Andrew. Uh, to take uh, for the last 10 minutes or so uh, questions that have been uh, put into the Q&A box or the chat box. So Andrew, the floor is yours again. Perfect. Um, thank you, Alex. So I'm going to now work my way through. Um, there's a number of questions that have come in to me. Please also do you just put them in uh, and either myself or one of the team will get back to you. So one of the questions that actually wasn't sent to us initially was Gareth was, uh, are we going to share out the email addresses? We're not going to provide a list of everyone that's attended today, uh, GDPR and also um, a case of people haven't consented to share them. However, that begs the question, how do you get in touch with the network? So at the moment, we've talked about it quite a bit. There's the Slack channel. You all should hopefully be have had the link. If not, we'll make sure it's shared out with the participants of this uh, conference or this webinar, sorry, afterwards. Um, and you'll be able to all link there. We also do have a list of everyone's email addresses. So if there's something you want to share with the network, please do make sure you email through to the group inbox and that goes directly to the council. And then what we can do is align that with other lines of effort and make sure the wider community is aware. Um, so we had the, the first question in. So this is one for Sebastian. I hope you're, you're still on the line. And you, the question is, you spoke about fear. How do you simulate the feeling of fear in wargaming? This is when Sebastian may or may not be on the call. Can someone check? He's still on the call, just muted at the call, moment. Might be muted. Sebastian, if you would like to unmute, you can answer that question. If not, I'm going to move on to the next question and then we can come back to you. Could you uh, say the question again? Of course, Sebastian. Thank you. Um, so the question was to you and it was, um, you spoke about fear in your presentation. And the question was, how do you simulate the feeling of fear uh, in wargaming? So when it comes to simulating fear, you can... Fear often comes from uncertainty and not knowing exactly what to do. 
and many other many of the other panelists discussed it in their games is that fear is not so much uh, you know I mean, a physical notion and a chemical reaction as much as the notion of what do I do now, right? And all of us, whether we have played commercial games or video games or professional academic analytical games, that question is often the most daunting. And as designers, <clears throat> whether it be as facilitators or war game designers, we aim to produce that, that what if, what do I do now moment. And that's really crafted through good design, uh, good immersion, but also good facilitation. So the real question is to put your players in hard and difficult choices uh, to replicate as much as possible those hard dilemmas of like of cost and risk and danger uh, in the sense of like if I go to do COA A, what are the costs and risk of taking that house, right? Or what other risks do I do if I you know, double down on this course of action and potentially risk another sort of dilemma, right? Those are really the hard choices that you want and that will invoke a sense of fear and risk and uncertainty that you want your players to really exist in the game. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. That's a great answer. And then we actually have another second question for you, uh, this time from Graham Longley Brown. Um, Graham, you, you asked a question um, uh, about educating people and uh, to use wargaming as a tool for professional education. Do you want to ask that question directly? Uh, please unmute and then you can ask that to Sebastian. Uh, he can't unmute, unfortunately. So apologies, Graham. Um, I will ask the question for you. So this was from Graham Longley Brown to you, Sebastian. Um, could you please tell us what the EWC is doing by way of educating people how to wargame, as opposed to using wargaming as a tool for professional education? So the EWC is still nascent, and we're still trying to find our a footing. But our goal is to help other educators learn from each other. Um, and it was inspired by my own experience of setting up the Georgetown uh, Wargaming class and uh, the Georgetown Wargaming Society, which is an extension of it. Um, on that note, I learned so much from my mentors like Matt Caffrey, Yuna Wong, um, Mike Arnberger, and Ed McGrady. And I was like, well, I imagine all the other people who are trying to set up Wargaming initiatives in their units uh, at their universities have the same questions I do. What, are, what is the best way where, uh, to introduce gaming theory and principles? What is the best games I can use for certain um, uh, conflicts or questions that I wanna teach, right? So in that way, I wanted to set up EWC as a way for us to collaborate on those notes. So to leverage, you know, I mean, the knowledge of people who have been doing this for a long time, like James Starrett at Command General Staff College has been teaching wargaming for a long time with his, you know, long, long time conspirator, uh, Mike Dunn for the U.S. Army. So like there should be no reason that UK Fight Club shouldn't be able to leverage his knowledge of understanding how to use Vassal in a remote uh, learning environment. Uh, how what games are good for certain problem sets like Race to the Rhine versus Frederick versus uh, South China Sea by Compass Games. Um, and what are some of the benefits of using digital games in certain forms like Command PE or Command Mission, uh, Combat Mission. So my hope was to get those skills to cross walk and cross talk against universities and PME institutions and operating units. Uh, and we have quite a mixture of, uh, of, of members in our in our organization from captains and majors who are in charge of uh, operating units in the fleet or in the army or in the Navy, uh, crosswalked with people who teach at PME institutions like the Naval War College um, and the Army War, Col War College and other people like myself who are at civilian institutions um, like McGill, um, Georgetown and other places. So the hope is to get all of us to, to share our knowledge um, and our skills and our best practices and our insights. Uh, and part of it's like sharing syllabuses, uh, part of it's sharing resources, like what are some great distributive games that you can play over Zoom? Um, one that I've learned recently was from Phil Sabin, who, you teach, who used to teach at King's College, and he uses this thing called Block War, which is super simple and fast, but it gets you to think about hard choices. And that's all real games are really about for education, is to force players to make hard choices. 
Yes, Sebastian, I completely agree. And, and thank you for that uh, answer to that question. So um, we've got a new question, another question here about uh, I'm you know, new to this and how do I get in touch with you? Um, I'll ask one of the team to share our email address with you. There's a, there's an inbox. There's also, I mentioned earlier, the Slack channels too. That's how you get in touch with either Fight Club members themselves or the council. You can get in touch with them via the email address. Um, so we've got another question here um, from Beth about for new people, for people that are new to wargaming, um, what would the panel recommendation develop skills and capabilities in this area? Now, Beth, I'm conscious of the time and um, we've got a lot of panelists on here. Um, I think in terms of what we can try to do at Fight Club is get that question answered to you, maybe um, post this uh, event part of out to the email addresses here on how we recommend you get involved in wargaming um, because that's something I think a lot of people will be interested in and we're hoping there's a lot of new people to this network here so something we might need to cover in a later session um, so the next question was specifically for Gregor um, and I understand there's a there's a slight an amendment to it so I need to make sure I get this right um, so Gregor where did you uh, get the advice on networking of VBS3 um, and were you running it on UVBT hardware or your own? And I know some of the answer to this question, but I'll let you answer it. And uh, where did you get the advice on this? And did you get enough support to do this? So Gregor, are you able to answer that question? Please unmute. Uh, yes, uh, thanks for Andrew. Um, yes, so we, first of all, yeah, we did get uh, quite a lot of support from uh, the EMEA uh, with regards to that, which was very, very helpful. Um, actually, the advice on networking VBS3 uh, initially came from basically uh, online uh, gaming forums because what we did is we just basically took the same solution that uh, you need for, say, like Armour 1 and Armour 2 uh, games, which were previously run over the internet, but because uh, the companies that provided the servers no longer existed, uh, uh, gamers had had to think up a solution for this. Um, so that's how we found out about using um, the Halachi VPN uh, for that. And then uh, in speaking with Bohemia, we found out they were looking at the same solution. Uh, it's just that we we managed to achieve it first. And then uh, the following week, they brought out a, um, a handout on how you can actually network uh, using a VPN. Uh, which is it, which is quite an easy handout to follow and stuff like that. And you can obtain this from Bohemia Interactive as well. Uh, and if you need to speak to them about uh, obtaining copies of VBS3 as well. Um, for the hardware, um, it was on our own laptops. Um, at the moment, due to the COVID restrictions, uh, Bohemia Interactive are allowing people to, to download it themselves, uh, obviously to deal with the, the fact that people are working from home. Uh, the one issue you might find with this is if you'd asked people about maybe five years ago, um, you'd probably find that a lot more people had laptops or, 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 or desktop computers. But one thing that we found is um, a lot of soldiers don't have a requirement to have a laptop nowadays. They've got an iPad or they've got, say, uh, an Apple computer, uh, which can play uh, VBS3. Or if they do gaming, uh, they're primarily doing it on uh, uh, PlayStation or Xbox and stuff like that. So that's just something to be aware of, is that you might not have as many people with uh, laptops sufficiently capable of running it as you, as you might think. Thanks, Gregor. Um, so I'll do one more question here from David Bates. And um, this one, I think is going to be probably for you, Dave Allen, or uh, any of the Fight Club team involved within the Grey Zone game. But the question was, how well advanced are the Grey Zone games? And can we adapt them to war game disasters and crises other than conflicts, e.g. natural disasters or internal security scenarios? So Dave, do you want to take that one, please? I mean, I would say they're, they're very much work in progress is they're only limited by the um, imagination of the people putting them together. I mean, the, the Sokur Grey Zone war game uh, was over Slack, Zoom, uh, and was effectively adjudicated by a white cell in, as a sort of formal matrix game. So, I mean, as long as your matrix adjudicators um, have experience and can understand um, the environment, they can be used for policing, could be used for natural disasters, could be used for pandemics. So I would say that there's a potential definitely there. Is uh, gray zone because it's not well understood uh, in many ways, uh, which is exactly how it's designed to do. It's about exploiting ambiguous thresholds. Um, so I would say they, they're, there's quite a lot out there. Uh, they are advanced, but they are, I would say, li only limited by the people who are administering them. 
I would say in terms of sort of automatic simulations, um, there's possibly not a great deal out there, uh, but going through sort of matrix simulations is uh, there are a number out there. And, and I see no reason whatsoever why uh, some of the other capabilities, uh, some of the other scenarios can't be tested. Uh, there are a number of policing and sort of internal security type games under development, and they would certainly be um, equally applicable as well. I don't know whether anyone else wants to jump in on that. Um, I think just I'll say here that Paul um, has put that yes, of course, um, everything can be, they can all be simulated. And I would also do it uh, if you're looking at maybe um, humanitarian crisis, um, Aftershock by Professor Rex Bryan and, and Thomas Fisher, who is uh, two people that a part of the network they released a game in 2015 uh, called Aftershock a humanitarian crisis game and, and that is a great way to introduce people to the, the troubles of NGOs and, and different governments in dealing with a, a, a natural crisis but I'm going to meet there because I think Paul's going to talk. Uh, nothing more to add Andrew you just added it in there um, part of the um, flight path that uh, Alex indicated was between session one and session two uh, in later in 21 uh, we plan to run a series of extended time frame virtual matrix games um, those of us who are old enough remember the, the play by mail games where you sent in terms and they got all adjudicated and sent out uh, it's kind of like an evolved version of that uh, and David I think your area of food security interest um, and other human domain crises would be a, a suitable area to simulate and develop so let's take this offline and explore so yes, thank you for that, Paul. So um, uh, unfortunately, everyone, that is all we have time for, um, you know, not running it too much over time. So thank you all so much for attending. I will hand back to Alex for any closing words. Uh, and if we haven't answered your questions, we will try to do that with a follow up and also with future webinars, we'll look to cover topics like the ones that we haven't done before. So thank you all. Yeah, and, and, and thank you um, again, uh, first of all, Sebastian for um, addressing us uh, from the States. Um, I would like to to focus on uh, the, the audience on, on the, the chat box. There are some um, some, some www uh, links towards his uh, to, towards Sebastian's organ organization where he's working for. Um, and the other one I would like to say is if you want to get in touch with us, uh, please keep an eye on the Twitter account we have. Um, if all went well, you have gained access to this webinar because we sent you an email. So that, that means you should have been in touch with us already. Um, so please use that form as well if you want to, to get in touch with us. Um, thanks. Thank you for, 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 for making up your, for making free uh, some time, uh, especially when, when it's in the news that all restrictions are back to uh, are getting a, a bit more restricted, so to say. Um, so probably a lot of our colleagues are busy with some last minute um, uh, activities uh, where, where the armed forces has to support government right now. Um, so conscious of time, thank you for your time. Thank you, uh, Sebastian again. Thank you, uh, Dave uh, and, and Gregor, Holly for your uh, experiences. Um, Nev from your UV, UVBT experiences and, and both Paul uh, and Stevie uh, from, from an historical background. Um, I will wish you, a, I want to wish you a very, very pleasant evening and for you, Sebastian, a very pleasant day. And I will um, hopefully see you or speak to you during our uh, future events on Fight Session 1 and or Fight Session 2. So thank you very much. Um, I'll speak to you later. <laughs>